Welcome to NFL Daily, where if we were a person, that person must be God. I'm Greg Rosenthal here <laughs> in the wrong. Chris Wesseling <laughs> podcast studio and so excited to be with two of my favorite humans, Colleen Wolf and Jordan Rodriguez. And yes, that quote will make a little more sense when we talk 49ers in a bit. Still kind of crazy open. out of context, <laughs> yeah. but strong. I open. like it. I do, I do too. I like that you got your special NFL kickoff shirt with your name on the back. I know. It's so fun. Hold on. Can I make this work? Big with, Colleen I'll hold the energy. Cord for you, Colleen. I'll hold yeah. the cord for you. Sorry. I, put I got a Connie thing on the back. You probably can't. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting a show and tell here. All right. Here. So um, here it is. <laughs> what an ad uh, for our YouTube right, show. Yeah, uh, yeah. Check us out on YouTube. You can subscribe there. Help our numbers there. Uh, how are you both? I'm excited for this show. You know, we got a little bit of news. We got our TNF preview as we do. Uh, but I'm most excited about kind of sitting down on the couch for a therapy session to try to Ooh, try to help yeah. out some people because that 0 and 1 just it feels rough after after week one. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm very accustomed to being on the other side of this, you mm. know, receiving the advice, receiving yeah. the the therapy, uh, I I, uh, I endorse this for everybody. I love it. <laughs> you better love it. it. Was your idea? Yes. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I cannot wait for this. I feel like I have already been talking so many people just like into a better headspace mm. after one week with their teams. So this felt just like a natural place to go. I, and also I have therapy right after this. <laughs> this is, this is, is the amazing. NFL season where we're just, we're, we're mo morphing two tasks into mm. one super task exactly. just to save time. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. love that. If I could, <laughs> if I could have one friend uh, that could be my therapist, I think it would be Connie. But before we get there, uh, let's you. do some news. Let's start with the Pittsburgh Steelers, who got a big road win in Atlanta. Nice start to the season. The only team in the AFC North that got a W after all that doom and gloom <laughs> in the preseason. And Justin Fields, I thought, played pretty well in that game. Mike Tomlin was asked about his quarterback situation on Tuesday, and it sounds like it's going in a certain direction. But as I sit here today, uh, we're preparing as if Justin is going to be our quarterback. I think that's the appropriate way to do it. Speculation is a waste of time. Uh, Russell's hurt. He's not available to us. <laughs> and so, as you guys know, as a general practice, man, I focus my energy on those that are available and their readiness. I love Mike Tomlin yeah, so much. He's the best. Speculation is a waste of time. And I know, like, that all makes sense. It's like, oh, maybe he would just say that for anyone. And I don't think so. I think there's actually a shift in the tone the, the reporters were trying to get him to say that Russell Wilson, if he was healthy, would he be the starter? And Mike Tomlin would not entertain that at all. I think this is Justin Fields' job as, as long as he keeps playing well. You know what I do like about this, other than him just shutting down the speculation and sort of the news cycle that would surround the any any hedging about the Russell Wilson situation, is that Justin Fields won't be in limbo like all the way up until 90 mm -hmm. minutes before kickoff on this. He'll have a full game week to prepare you know, he will be in, you know, that mode in, in the starter seat, basically. And and it's not like, you know, they, everyone says, oh, we prepare as if we're the starter. There is a difference in meeting structure in how you organize your week in how you study in everything because you will be in that seat. And you're not, again, doing this 90 minutes before kickoff. I just love Mike Tomlin, his the whole <laughs> aura about him. He doesn't like hypotheticals. He doesn't like to speculate. Now, normally his protocol is typically for players to be available to practice on Fridays if they're going to play on Sundays. But the more veteran you are, mm. the less it matters that you're available on Friday. But he said, I treat everybody fair. I don't treat everyone the same. I just feel like he has these quotes all of the time. I would love to just sit down. I would love to have a beer with Mike Tomlin. That's kind of my dream beer guest um, in my life. But also, I feel like if there was an NFL coach you'd be most likely to get a beer with, he's pretty close to the top of the list. I think you can make this happen. Combine week. Yeah, you come see to the him combine. out there. Yeah, come I to mean, the combine. My wheels are turning right now. And <laughs> I'm going to have to manifest <laughs> this, I think. That's, that's very exciting to think about. <laughs> but hey, Justin Fields, like the fact that he didn't have any turnovers in that game, I think was such a huge plus because with that defense that they have, if they can just have someone at the quarterback position that doesn't make mistakes or put them in a bad situation, they're kind of an interesting team now in that division. Justin Fields played well in that game. Yeah. I, I don't know if the matchup 
you know, was just that favorable against the Falcons. We'll have to wait and find out. But I went to watch that and there was so much negativity about, you know, they didn't score a touchdown. That, that's not ideal. And I didn't expect a great performance. And it, the first three plays were very Justin Fields. He fumbled the snap on the first one. That was an issue in training camp. It, maybe it's the center. Maybe it's him. Uh, then a really bad pass that was open. Short passes, mm-hmm. you know, not always his thing. Uh, but then he runs for a first down on the third play. And as the game went along, like there were a lot of key runs, but there was a great 36 yard throw that was overturned by a penalty. There was another nice bomb down the field to Pickens later in the game. There was a nice like third and long. He made a lot of winning plays. I went and like looked at the PFF grades afterwards. He was a top 10 quarterback according to them last week. Like there was more than enough. I think they were, I've been pleasantly surprised and he's not working with a full deck of like great wide receivers and I, I think Mike Tomlin's probably pretty excited about what's going on. But also consider this, they're going to Denver. Like they're playing the Broncos and Russell Wilson is just going to be on the bench. Oh my gosh. Why did I not <laughs> think about that? That, um, in yeah. Full and, pa- in full pads. There was a lot of like probably. anti-fields agenda on the internet too. That was just like, he must be terrible, but no, he he's fine. Like the weirdest fan in sports right now is the Steelers fan who is like, Die hard Russell Wilson. We got to go with Russell Wilson. Like, what allegiance do you have to him? You know what I think? I'm so excited to see the little quarterback throw heat charts at the end of this next game of Broncos Steelers because Bo Nix, one of them is going to be just everything is in the same. <laughs> and, then, and, and then the other one is Justin Fields. Art Smith is doing what Justin Fields likes to do, less so of what we thought he was going to do. He's acquiescing and compromising a little bit, collaborating with the skill set that is quarterback seems to prefer data tells us this over time and it, it kind of looked like, I mean, he was, he was slinging it wide a little bit. How so that it, all the throws were to the outside. Yeah, We were talking mean? about art Smith and how everything was going to be right in the middle of the field. And, but it seems like our, our guy art, you know, name change, facial hair change. Mm. He's going with art. Yeah. He's well, going we've, with deci- art we've decided. Okay. This. Yeah. I just it's like, a, I like it it's a art. rebrand. And look, they, he's had more time with fields ultimately through training camp and now, the preseason well, to your, to your a point winnable too, game. It was enough positive plays. I think you said this on, on social media, Greg, there was enough positive plays to make this regardless of the Wilson of it all to make this an easier decision. Justin Fields had enough positive plays in that game. Plus the, he tried to return, I think quickly Russell Wilson from the calf injury mm-hmm. and maybe re injured it. Cause he was worried about losing that starting job. Always look to the contract. They only gave Russell Wilson like a million dollars. Like he's getting paid about the same amount of money as Tyler Huntley out there. Uh, let's move on to our next story. Mike Shanahan uh, is the father of Kyle Shanahan. Uh-huh. Um, and they both like to play games, I believe, with injuries and the media. And this happened with running backs. And it certainly happened in Mike's day. And it happened in Kyle's day uh, on Monday Night Football. So many fantasy football owners mm. were upset that Christian McCaffrey was ruled an active And a little bit of a controversy after the game when Jordan Mason, who's, who stepped in, told the media he found out, at least according to him, that he was starting on Friday. Uh, Kyle Shanahan was asked about a report from ESPN that said already there's a real chance McCaffrey could miss week two. I'm saying it's amazing that person must be God because we just found <laughs> out he wasn't playing today and I have no idea how he's going to feel tomorrow and or the next day. Um, I thought he was playing this whole week until today. So, um... I don't know who knows that he's playing, not playing next week. I want to believe that he's telling the truth, but coaches just do just straight up lie. So what do you, what do you think? Is he? I mean, I just think it would be amazing if you had an inside track to God as mm. your, like unnamed source. That would be, that would be pretty oh, helpful. Schefter and Rappaport are working on it. It's been an angle <laughs> that they've been like trying to make happen, but uh-huh. I don't know. I don't, of course there's a real chance by the way that Chris McCaffrey isn't playing week two. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't play week one and he's been trying to recover from this injury for weeks. It's called Achilles tendonitis. Kyle Shanahan did speak on Tuesday and said if it was a playoff game, he would have played on Monday night, but it is not a playoff game. These games only matter so much for the 49ers. Yeah. And I mean, they were so productive on the ground, even without you have space, you have like wiggle room, you have leeway to let Christian McCaffrey rest a little bit. Um, As everyone knows, I have a very ominous respect for Kyle Shanahan and um, especially the the darkness that seems to seep through his mm. general being. Uh-huh. Um, Tell me more about including that. His under, <laughs> including his, 
his knowledge of, you know, forces beyond our control, such as, I don't know if anyone will be alive, any of us will be alive on Sunday, that famous quote oh from a couple my of years God, ago. That's right. Now he's But talking, that speaks to me. That's like, hey, now, that's a person that has experienced some tragedy in his life. He's, he's right. Now he's calling out, you know, he's calling out God as a source. I mean, this this guy is walking very, very close to something paranormal right now. What did you say? Your ominous darkness? That I have an making? ominous respect. Oh, ominous uh-huh. respect. Uh, I love that. It's uh, a, the highest compliment I can pay somebody. Let's dive into that on the couch uh, <laughs> I, a little bit I later. It. Uh, much more positive uh, was Matt Eberflus when talking about Caleb Williams and his debut. Not that we didn't mention it on the Sunday recap, but it was kind of a big deal that the number one overall pick didn't get to 100 yards passing yeah. on 29 attempts. They did not score. I mean, that's just crazy. Uh, Matt Eberflus, though, saw a lot of good out of Caleb in his first game. Uh, yeah, I think he would say that too. Just you know, his, his footwork a little bit off so, at times, but uh, again, he threw a lot of good pl- good passes too. So uh, met with him this morning, and that was really about it. I thought his vision was good. Yeah, I thought he was. I thought he was good. I thought he saw it well. I thought he you know saw the coverage contours. He saw zero. Um, you know, them adjusted on the fly. You know, in terms of pr- post snap, I thought he did a nice job. What What do you think? How How in terms of how he looked? I'm not surprised. Matt Eberflus, of course, is going to support his guy a thousand he has to do percent. That. I also am not encouraged after hard knocks that that one-on-one meeting he had with Caleb Williams was that insightful. I mean, I was kind of refreshed by his comments about, I mean, he, he very openly and, and clearly we're talking about therapy, man, Mm -hmm. set a boundary in terms of the leeway and the patience that he expects the world and the outside world, especially to have with a rookie quarterback who yes, is one of the best prospects we've we've ever seen come into the league, but is going to have days like this where even a four man rush is is kind of getting getting him off his spot a little bit, struggling to connect a little bit, maybe uh, second guessing what he's seeing. I would like to see him just kind of cut loose and, and play free. I think that as himself and Shane Waldron feel each other out in live action a little bit more against live defenses, not preseason regulated looks, um, you're going to start to see them understand each other and how. Caleb likes to play and, and really accentuate that a little bit more, or at least you hope that that's what will happen with the offensive coordinator. But yeah, I, I actually was really refreshed by what Matt Eberflew said because he basically, it wasn't a message to the media. It was a message mm. to Caleb and to the rest of the world. Like we're giving this guy patience because we believe in him and he's going to be learning in public and learning out loud for the next year. And that's what a rookie season for any quarterback is. Yeah. And Flus also talked about that third and five, the stop route that he thought was excellent and that, the rhythm and the timing was there on some of the plays, but I, I I, don't think anyone expected Caleb to come out and just absolutely light everything on fire. Like, sure, maybe you wanted something a little bit better than what we saw, but there was some good with the bad. And then it wasn't all Caleb's fault. Keenan Allen had the huge drop on the touchdown catch. I mean, there were a few other passes that could have been also considered drops potentially, too. So... Floos is just doing what Floos needs to do at hey, this point. That's just Floos being Floos. I mean, you get a win without any offensive touchdowns. That that is incredible. I think the interior offensive line is their number one concern, yeah, maybe, of the entire team. They have a former Ram, Coleman Shelton at center, who did not have a good day. They almost openly are talking about, I think, wanting to bench uh, a free agent pickup, Nate Davis, but the guy who would replace him isn't quite healthy enough to do so. That's Ryan Bates. But everyone who said this is the best situation ever for a a rookie quarterback to enter. It's like, yeah, you got, you got some weapons, but now a hurt and he's week to week. He's, he's almost certainly out this week and you're getting a ton of pressure up the middle and you're a shorter quarterback compared to most. That's, that's a lot to deal with. Then again, they won't play against Jeffrey Simmons and Tavondre Sweat every week who, who kind of dominate. Yeah, but so. but the interior even had issues when they sent extra pressure. They didn't need to send extra pressure all the time, but mm. they even sent another former Los Angeles, er- Ernest Jones, on a blitz and, and bowled Coleman Shelton backwards. That was the clip that sort of went viral oh, during during the game. And But it, to your point, like the interior pressure, no, they're not going to face fronts like this every week, but you can manufacture that as well. So shoring that up is a, is a huge concern to me. And then also, again, like moving his pocket, getting him sort of working in space a little bit more, but then also layering things. You you did hear a couple of times, and you heard this in Seattle all the time last year. Oh, I think one of those receivers was running 
right in front of the other receiver and they're basically running the same route, just different lengths. Mm. And you you want to make sure that if you have a quarterback who is move, like working on the move or out of structure, that those layers are all over the field, not just sort of stacked as if they're like nesting dolls. So Coleman Shelton, Ernest Jones, that's X, X Ram on Ram. I don't know where that even came from. So I, was like, <laughs> I, I like a little nesting dolls reference uh, in any show. Uh, but yeah, uh, you still managed to you know, fit in some Rams talk in here. Oh, You've got a, kill me. You've got a bad view with that. Sorry. <laughs> Ernest Jones. Yes, guy. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the dynamic kickoff. How are we feeling? I just feel like we didn't. This was such a big story all offseason, all preseason. Can we revisit just where we're at with the dynamic kickoff? About a third of the kicks were returned, which doesn't sound like a lot. Actually, it's not even about a third. It was exactly a third. Okay. But last year it was 22%. So that's that's up like 11%. The average return went to about the 29. So, but that doesn't include the kickoff touchdown, which so ultimately you were probably better off on average just kicking it into the end zone and starting at the 30, like, are, are, is it doing enough for you? Are, is, I mean, is it making you feel something for inside, me, Colleen? The DJ Dallas dynamic touchdown is really the only thing that made me feel something uh, with the new rule. There was another long return in that game, actually, I believe by the Bills. Yards. Am I crazy? Yes. 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 Yards. Yeah. So there was a couple. Yeah. There's a little more. It's like in the right direction. Improved field position, though, means more scoring. So like, even if it is all these touchbacks, the fact that the average starting field position is going up about five yards, that's kind of a win just on its own because the scoreboard will be higher. Yeah. Jordan, are you impressed by it? Not yet. Just because I, and I, <laughs> I agree. And, and it, the, the scoring increasing, that's obviously going to be a, a reaction to this just by nature of moving the ball up, but the ball is moving up and the line of scrimmage is moving up based on a function of the rule itself, not, the average of the plays that are being made from said rule. Well, like, both. These are the both. average starting field position for all, all drives after receiving a dynamic kickoff was the receiving team's own 29.4 yard line. So it, it's, it's like, it, it's a, that's, that's what the rule is. That's a function of, I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the year and Roger Goodell actually mentioned this last week in his interview before the, uh, the Eagles Packers game mm. that they are open to changing this rule to, really? to adjusting it. Yeah. Oh, to, yeah. To talking about it in terms of moving that field position up to try to prohibit, like prevent teams from just kicking the touchback. Okay. Huh. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, into, I'd be into that. 35 is aggressive, but, uh, it, it would be interesting. I think it's a, it's a small win. So far, nothing too crazy. It, the, the thing that annoys me is the coaches like Sean McVay, who are just afraid to compete. He's like, I don't want to it's I don't want to deal with the uncertainty. And so he's kicking with a touch. Like, hey, how about you try to just be great at everything that is now involved in your football game I'm, instead of just giving up? I'm not going to be trapped into talking about the Rams. <laughs> OK, a um, <laughs> couple small just news items. We had mentioned Derek Brown was likely out for the season. He's the uh, great defensive tackle for the Panthers. That was confirmed as he was sent to season ending uh, IR on Tuesday. And then Juju Brents, who is a Colts starting uh, cornerback, a thin position for them, also going to injured reserve. And then finally, I mentioned on Monday night with Shook uh, that Deshaun Watson um, received another civil lawsuit. The NFL now says it's reviewing the lawsuit uh, that accuses Deshaun Watson of sexual assault and battery in October of 2020, back when he was with the Texans. Quote, and this is from the league spokesperson, Brian McCarthy, we are reviewing the complaint and we will look into the matter under the personal conduct policy we are not looking at the commissioner's exempt list as there's been no formal charges and the league's review has just begun. The Browns say, quote, we will respect the due process our legal system affords regarding the recently filed civil suit and follow the NFL's guidelines on this matter. So just between those two statements, it sounds like for now, uh, the Browns and the NFL aren't doing anything, but there is an investigation uh, that the NFL will undergo. All right, let's take a quick break. And we are going to be back. And we're going to just talk about things that we just can't get out of our mind. That we need to, I don't know, just feel a little more comfortable with. We are back Ooh. on NFL Daily. And uh, we are so lucky every week 
to have Colleen Wolf with us. I mean, what a big get. Wow. For the show. It was tough. Guys, it was, it please, wasn't easy to get it. her. So <laughs> I'm so busy these days. If we've got, if we, uh, if we have like a loose plan of maybe what we're going to do on Tuesday and we get a text from Colleen, uh, who has an executive producer credit now as part of this show. Oh, nice. that's great. Um, Congratulations. Do I get a and, little, uh, bump too? <laughs> No, nope, just the credit. Okay, great. <laughs> That's how we pay you. Uh, and she comes and she says, I got a new idea. We're going to flip the old idea. Let's go with the new idea. We're going to replace it. Yeah. Um, then we're going to do it. And that, I now uh, bring no you. No disrespect to the other idea. No. Which I think it's is. It's all good. Awesome. It was Greg's idea. It's the all other good. One. No. It, it was. It was. Yeah. It was. <laughs> that was the only problem. I feel like we're on the couch now. We need to work <laughs> this out. But no, this is good. I think after week one, there's a lot of figures in the NFL that, that could use some therapy. Mm -hmm. We all uh, love therapy. Yeah. And uh, Colleen, I want you to start. That's sort okay. of a long winded way of getting you to start so that I can feel what this segment really is all about. Okay. That's great. Um, well, yeah, I just like to offer people emotional support. Um, I feel like that's that's what good friends do. And, you know, around these parts, especially th this time of year, I find myself offering maybe a little bit more emotional support than I'm, mm. than I'm used to. So might as well just keep it going. And I'm going to send this one out to Jaguars fans. Mm. Um, guys, you know, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Which is a shame because what a start to that game. <laughs> so well. Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas Jr. both had like really bright moments. The defense was really holding up in the first half. The vibes, they were good. Until things got a little uncomfortable. But listen, I understand how quickly things can change. I watched the Eagles start 10-1 and one last year and finish 1-5. and five. I also watched the Jags finish one and five last year. We all got hurt. We're all trying to love again. <laughs> Travis Etienne's goal line fumble, not ideal. In fact, nightmare fuel. Um, <laughs> being up 24 to seven would have made things a lot more comfortable. But being a football fan, it's not about comfort. Mm. It's about pain and suffering and holding on to a glimmer of hope. <laughs> This roster is replete with talent. Ryan Nielsen is a really good defensive coordinator. The defense sacked Tua three times, held the Dolphins under 100 rushing yards, limited Miami to 20 points, an offense that scored nearly 30 points per game last season, just two touchdowns the entire game. So everybody, get it together. It's just one game. Mm. Your season is not defined by week one. It's your home opener this week, and you play the Browns, who looked way more of a mess than you did. <laughs> that so, should make them feel you know? uh, a lot better. And I think that was excellent. Uh, the Browns, they're, they're a, a case. A I, don't, I don't it, think we would even want to try to tackle in this Therapy situation. rule number one, it can always get worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the comparison between the Eagles and the Jaguars because I think the way their seasons ended last year, <laughs> yeah. their fans and those teams could have used a little counseling. Uh -huh. and, I got to say that Eagles fan that and you tell me like that win in week one to me felt bigger because of the way last season yeah. ended that you want to feel like this is different. So I do kind of get why it's triggering for Jaguars fans to have a 17 to three lead. It was like last oh. season all over again in one game. And to start that way is tough. Yeah. I mean, that was it was so rough. And they better win this week because they're going on the road for back to backs against the Bills on Monday Night Football and then the Texans. So if they lose to the Browns, who look the way that they did last week, and then they have to go to Buffalo and then they have to mm. go to Houston, I hate that for them. Okay, we're, we're out of the <laughs> office now because I feel like this is putting some <laughs> this uncomfortable is like my, future this, expectations. Let's focus on what's right, right, right in front right. of us. You have to be present. You kind of like this Jaguars team, don't you? Yeah, Jordan? I do. I do. I, I mean, I like the talent. I like the potential. I've said uh, a couple times this, this offseason, I'd like to see with this coaching staff, everyone take a step forward. Um, closing a game such mm. as this would be a mm. nice start to that. Um, but saw some really nice things from, from Trevor Lawrence, uh, some of the windows he was fitting the ball into. Um, I, I do understand though, the trauma projection yes. element of this, mm. Colleen. I, I mean, I, I really understand, you know, you had some, 
some demons to get out yourself and and really place onto the shoulders of Jags fans. And in that way, you are free. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that's how you process it. You send it off onto someone else. And uh, that was a good shout to uh, Brian Nielsen and the coordinator. Because for most of that game, they're playing a lot of man oh. coverage against the Dolphins. It was a little surprising. And if you take out those two big plays, which I know is a big if, but if you took out the two other oh. plays, like... They look pretty good in that game. The running game was good. I they look like a different team to me. It was a couple drops really hurt them. Yeah. All right, let's go um to my counseling session. Okay. And I'm so glad that uh Joe Burrow is joining me here. Oh. And uh I'm glad he came in, Joe. Uh I understand your concern about your one and eight record in weeks one and two in your career. That's outrageous. And uh it's true the numbers aren't pretty. Out of 45 quarterbacks over the last few years, in those weeks one and two, you are 39th out of 45, Joe. Um, so I want to bring up something sensitive, uh, but you pay me a lot of money. Like, I'm worth it. Uh, so I'm going to give it to you straight. You, you looked a little afraid to, to play aggressive, Joe. And uh, I think that's natural. You're coming off a wrist surgery. Uh, the Pats, really good. Defense, show you a lot of disguised looks. Uh, I think you can learn from this because uh, this is not the Joe we know. Dinkin' and Duncan. Throwing the ball short on third down when there's guys in single coverage on the outside. The Joe we know doesn't check down. The Joe we know was there at training camp. We saw it. it was, there was proof. We saw it in the preseason that he was ripping it. It's not about your wrist, Joe. You just have to get used to it. And I have a theory for you, Joe. Um... It's all about Joe Cool. You've been in such big games before. Super Bowl, the national championship. And uh, sometimes it's just like tough to feel like weeks one and two. <laughs> it just makes you, it's a little dead inside. Do these games like really matter? And that's why I, I'm here to tell you, Joe, like this is the perfect week for you. You're going to Arrowhead. That is the opponent you actually want in week two because weeks one and two do matter. You do batter Joe Burrow a six-point underdog they used to call this place Joe Burrowhead don't listen to uh anyone out there weeks one and two do matter and uh, I think this is the week you make all those stats go away he does always thrive when there's something you know maybe he just needs a little push you yeah know? just a little push like like you're saying and and he really but he does thrive he's got that you know, the C.J. Strouds have that. The Matthew Staffords have that. That little mm -hmm. that little killer mentality that is like a switch that flips on where you're very calm and cool on the outside, mm. but and maybe icy. You know, hair 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 reference. Um, but but you're you're ready to just rumble on the inside. And I think that maybe this environment, this challenge, the stakes of this, and also watching his own tape from this last week. And I don't know who that man is situation i mean that's that's got to be a, a little bit of a motivating factor maybe we, we're on chip alert mm. for, for joe Ooh. burrow but i mean he's got to do some creation of it himself i think i really hit when you talked about joe burrow being used to these huge big game scenarios with all of like the pressure and all of the eyes just like uh, feeling something for a week one game, even right. though, yes, it is a big deal. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes during the season, it's like you're in week five. Like uh, sometimes just in general, it's tough to feel things inside if it's not right. like a massive moment. I, I so identify with that. Line. It's why we have to work on Colleen a lot before these Tuesday shows. <laughs> She's been in such a big spot. It's like, all right, let's. Let's bring it. Let's wake up. Um, mm -hmm. But what a big spot this week. So, I'm, so you're I, Arrowhead in this situation. You're not Joe. You're. I'm talking to Joe. I'm his Colleen. counselor. No, I'm saying with uh, Colleen. With Colleen. You are, you are the Chiefs in this situation. And Colleen no, I think Joe. I'm more the, you're the biggest favorite in the league on a, on a 1 p.m. game against the Patriots. That's NFL Daily. Like, uh, he, we need to get... Colleen to just feel a little more juice. Listen, these spots. I am. This is my highlight of the week, Greg. I love all my shows equally. <laughs> <laughs> we got her in the headset today. Uh, yeah, that exactly. is true. <laughs> and it looks great. All right, Jordan, you're up. Okay. You guys, this time of year, this falls under the category of desperately seeking self-help. Okay. okay. Because this time of year, many people go to therapy to approach the difficult to navigate dinner table discussions between opinionated factions at 
the holidays, Ooh. right? This is about that time you start seeking answers and tools. So I'm here to tell you how to talk to your loved ones about Sam Darnold. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh my <goodness. laughs> My points are three. Three, my points are. Okay, first step in how to talk to your loved ones about Sam Darnold. Point to the tape. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a plug for NFL Pro because what a great website. Sam Darnold opened Sunday's game by halftime 13 for 14 for 151 yards and a touchdown. He looked confident the entire game, made a couple of iffy decisions, but for the most part, made good decisions, a couple of tight window throws, and the offense felt really cohesive. Step two, acquiesce that he has more help in his head coach, Kevin O'Connell. <laughs> <laughs> his receivers, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, and Jalen Naylor, and his run game with Aaron Jones. Jones, 6.7 yards per carry, 94 yards, 4.94 yards per rush after contact, which is the highest for a Vikings running back since week 10 in 2022. Um, hat tip to my colleague Alec Lewis Ooh. for digging that stat up. But they're actually not um, playing cushion the quarterback as much as you would think. So less play action than I thought they would run. They're only 19.2% uh, uh, play action use. And they, they've got him in shotgun like 70% of the time where he went 13 for 17 for 156 yards and two touchdowns. Kevin O'Connell is giving him multiple correct answers on a play. Um, there's been one going around where um, it's a 22 yard pass to Josh Oliver, the tight end. And really what's so special about the, the, the coordination of the offense and the design of the play from Kevin O'Connell is that if the Giants coverage rules on that play dictated that three players flowed toward Justin Jefferson, leaving Josh Oliver open in the seam, or under less coverage than he would have been on that vertical in the seam. If one player would have peeled away from Justin Jefferson, so breaking the tendency rules that Kevin O'Connell and Sam Darnold are studying, then that's when you hit Justin Jefferson and you're able to lead him probably for a touchdown. So even if the defense does everything right, there's an answer. If the defense does one thing, quote unquote, wrong, there's also mm. an answer. So providing Sam Darnold multiple answers on one play. And number three, but Sam Darnold has been so streaky while with the Jets and Panthers. At some point, he'll be a pumpkin again. You can admit to your loved ones that the data is clear on this. But now you can accept a compromise. Mm. It's okay for a quarterback with a high ceiling and one of the streakiest middles and floors we've seen from a high draft pick <laughs> to get that middle and floor elevated by the ecosystem around him. It's also true that he may have some tougher days. History says he will. Both can be true at the same time. The point mm. is Minnesota is maximizing production on the high moments and limiting opportunities to make bad decisions or negative plays. That's how you talk to your loved ones. Wow. I love that, yeah. Jordan. I Sam mean, Darnold. Two things can be true at once. The duality of Sam Darnold is what I'm hearing. <laughs> I um, am a little worried that when I get deep into the tendencies of coverage rules and how three people are going to go with Justin Jefferson to my loved ones that I'm going to lose track of it and they won't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> this is how you actually yeah, get them. Yeah, okay. This is how you get them. It's a little deep. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. I feel like this feels a little targeted towards me, maybe. I'm, uh, I'm just giving the public some advice and therapy on the self-help time of this holiday the season. The public is, is quickly approaching. I Look, mean, the Darnold Hive, it, <laughs> they're going to enjoy week one. Mm -hmm. It is a great situation. They're I not gonna play so, the. I was so excited when I saw Sam Darnold. <laughs> I I'm excited to watch this team as much as I like. I I agree with you. I think the floor is gonna be higher. That he's been a disappointing player, and he's got a real chance to rewrite the type of player he is, where that he can be a useful NFL uh, starter. But. They're going to get over their skis, you know, the, the Darnold Hive. I only Maybe. heard the first part of your sentence, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Colleen, let's okay. go around the, the room one All more right. time. So here we go. This one goes out to Jets fans. Mm. <laughs> hey, Jets fans. It's your old friend, Colleen. <laughs> here to offer you a shoulder to cry on because that's what friends are for. Tough draw for week one. Open the season on the road. Last game of the week against a team that almost won the Super Bowl. Reached the NFC Championship three times in the last five years. It was rough. I'm not going to lie. A team without one of their most dynamic weapons and a surprise pregame twist. 
who used an undrafted free agent out of Georgia Tech to rush for 147 yards on your defense. A defense ran by Robert Sala and Jeff Ulbrich, both former 49ers. But the strongest steal goes through the hottest fire. Mm. So at some point, these crucibles should pay off. Aaron Rodgers, he still has a cannon of an arm. You waited an entire year for Rodgers to come back. You have to trust the patience, trust the process. And I know it's been repeated 100,000 times from the book of Aaron Rodgers, relax. (laughs) I know I always respond so well when someone else tells me to relax. (laughs) So tighten things up. You actually have the Titans next week who, just like you, lost. Maybe give Hassan Reddick a call. And remember, (laughs) it's not as bad as last year's week one loss. They won uh, week one last year, right? But this is like... uh, But the Aaron Rodgers of it all. You would rather, uh, Robert Sala said, uh, you would rather lose with Aaron Rodgers than win without him, essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I did like on the broadcast, they had a, a sort of a graphic celebrating after Rodgers made it past four plays. It was like a little ticker on the... They did? That's rude. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's too much. Um, I do put myself in the shoes, though, of, of listening in this therapy session. And I think if going through the crucible made you stronger... Um, the Jets fans and their organization would be the strongest in the they are. NFL. And yet, where are the results? You know? Well, they're still going through it. Okay. They're still building. They're still, like, fortifying. I, I think there was something there, too, with the whole Robert Sala, Kyle Shanahan thing. I don't know. that. I can't... Like, he knew... Ominous respect. I guess you could have said... <laughs> he has ominous respect. If the well. Jets had gone in there and won, I could say the opposite. But he felt... I felt like he really knew what to do to scramble this great Robert Sala defense. Because that's the worst Jets performance since Robert Sala has been there in terms of the defense. He knew exactly how to attack that group. And he used to go against Robert Sala every single day in practice. It is a classic Kyle Shanahan against the former coach Mm. move to play a deep reserve running back or, you know, former undrafted or late round pick running back and just hammer your biggest weakness on defense, which is their defensive line with especially minus Reddick, um, and just hammer and hammer and hammer and like circle the group on the little whiteboard in the meetings with a green circle. And then that's who you run at the entire time. That is a classic Kyle Shanahan versus former assistant move that front. I mean, to counter a little, I mean, I, how dare you? I think <laughs> I think the Titans are also going to run the snot out of the ball at this front. So Joe Douglas, man, take Colleen's therapeutic advice. Mm. Get on the phone. Hassan Reddick, where are you? Right. I don't know. Those problems, I don't know if Hassan Reddick can fix them all, but he would help. It would it would be nice. Yeah. You traded a third round pick for him. All right. I'm gonna um take you to something a little different than the, okay. like a therapist office. This is more of a, a crisis management team at the uh oh wow the nfl league office actually oh, God. <laughs> hotline it's roger goodell's office um let's start with the bad news boss raj can i call you uh yeah that, that was the fewest passing touchdown since 06 that's true in a week one uh back then the the top quarterbacks that week were donovan McNabb, kurt warner and charlie batch no way Fun quarterback, Charlie Batch. Uh, the fewest net passing yards since 2000 in a week one. Down almost 30% from the all-time high, which was only five years ago. That was fun when we just thought we were going to be putting up 40 every week, and it's yeah. passing, passing, passing. Um, only two 300-yard passers. All of that's bad. You know what's good? What? Evolution. <laughs> this is a game where whatever's in eventually goes out. And whatever is out goes in. And you know what made people fall in love with football in the first place? It's physicality. It's the running game. It's steamrolling over defenders. When the, when the sport exploded in the 70s and 80s, that was the sport. And the running game is coming back. And if you look at the EPA per play, we are closer than we have been in so long to a run being as efficient as a pass on average, if you include quarterback scrambles, they actually were in week one, which is absolutely crazy, Raj, which gets to my other point here. People love the quarterbacks running. That was the most quarterback rushing yards in a week one 
ever. Like, what is more fun than a quarterback running? It's not hurting scoring. We fix things, you know, a little bit with the field position. As long as we're scoring, like, things will change. The coolest kids in the league, like Mike McDaniel, are putting fullbacks on the field and multiple tight ends. Like, it's all an evolution, and the evolution is what makes our sport better than all the others. It is. It cycles around every five to seven years. You're seeing defensive personnel also get larger, but also more hybrid safeties mm. who can play linebacker again, like we did 10, eight, 10 years ago. You're seeing multiple tight ends on the field for a lot of teams. You're seeing teams load up and play keep away either with that heavy personnel and a great running back or a tandem of running backs who are splitting a carry share and using the quarterback as not just a running weapon, but a, a battering ram. If I'm talking about Anthony Richardson, that amazing play Ooh. that he made over the weekend, you're using all of this to score versus these explosive pass plays. And, and the league is sort of rubber banding back from where defense is. I kind of like it. I kind of like that, like a big time passing day, like Tua had a big passing day, like feels really special. I like it because it feels different because I just at some point I just assumed it was going up forever. And I think it's cool that it's, it's a little different. Yeah, everything old is new again. Mm. It's and that is the case for the NFL. Mm. I will tell you. Yes, my hill that I will die on the tiny table uh -huh. take that is a little too wild for tiny table day. That Let's I'll not stand talk on. about our tiny table <laughs> take. I yeah. said the Cowboys were going to self-implode. Yeah. Walking away from that tiny table. I think that if passing stays down, scoring is scoring is, is up and, and the same and that's good. And that's what the league cares about, obviously. But if passing stays down, I do think more rule changes could be on. The sure. Board. Oh yeah. That, that was part yeah. of uh, the, the subtext. We don't want to get in trouble here, but yes, we're always, you know, looking to just put our finger on the dial to help out those quarterbacks. It's fun. People like it. Plus, let's see a little more long ball, though. Like the average air yards per attempt has been like nose diving. All the passes are shorter. I don't love that. I like, just want more Anthony Richardson. Yes, bombs. That, that's he's kind of exactly what we want. Running and bombs. All right. Final one. Jordan. Well, this is more of a pep talk slash dose of reality here. Mm. Panthers fans, this is your life, and I hope it gets better. Oh, Panthers fans, I truly want better for you. You deserve better than partner after partner, season after season, forecasting to you a lifetime of happiness and joy only to leave you crying on your couch after some transgression. It's not your fault. Mm. So instead, I can't watch you get hurt anymore. So instead of opening yourself up to once again, hope and cautious optimism, and I know, I know it's tempting to listen to the hope mongering and buy back in. It's time to steal yourselves to reality. This team will be rebuilding for multiple years. The roster inherited and in part enabled by general manager Dan Morgan is a disaster to veteran and depleted at key positions on defense. Um, even Ejiro Ever Evero, who's regarded as a top defensive coordinator, uh, is having a hard time scheming around some of this. Um, if you have to claim three DBs off of waivers on August 28th, you are in danger, girl. <laughs> the offense <laughs> is still obviously a work in progress at receiver, tight end, running back, and multiple off offensive line position. Rebuilding takes time. It takes patience. Only a team with an above average to elite quarterback can sprint rebuild. And it's still not clear whether you do have a quarterback who can lead you into the next era. Getting a clean evaluation of Bryce Young is the most important task this season. When you know what you have at quarterback or don't have, you can define the rebuild window. Developing a very young, very relatively inexperienced head coach in Dave Canales is the second most important thing. Mm. Overhauling the talent identification process within the pro and college scouting departments, which Dan Morgan quietly started to do this summer, is third. It will take time, and I don't know who needs to hear this. Somebody important, probably. <laughs> but without a quarterback, this type of ecosystemic construction will take multiple years. It will take patience. It will take a non-reactionary understanding of where to keep developing and where to cut ties. Panthers fans, I want you to win. Mm. I want you to feel the rush of joy, but I can't watch you build up hope every spring and summer only to suffer. After all that's happened, perhaps there's freedom too and simply going numb for a while. Yeah. 
I think that's a good idea. Got to surrender. This season, be like, be like our friend David Ely in the newsroom, and he's just—he's not claiming the Panthers anymore. He's just like, he'll come back someday. Yeah. But I think he's disconnecting for a little while, and that's okay. When you have someone toxic, something toxic in your life, it's okay to just cut them out until they they get better. Yeah, you just gotta let a let loosen your grip on the wheel a bit, mm. and um, maybe just uh, hit autopilot for a little while. It's a long season. I do worry that you won't get like a complete evaluation of Bryce Young if every game was like this. But I I think the offensive line, which wasn't terrible, I didn't think in this game actually. Like there was a couple busts in terms of figuring things out with blitz. Bump into your quarterback as your yeah. It 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 wasn't great, but uh, hopefully that part of it improves. They do need a left tackle though. You know they whiffed on on Iki uh, Khan. I just don't think that's ever going to happen for them. But that's why you, you got to go numb. All right, let's not go numb to our TNF preview. That's going to be right after the break. We'll see you then. Back on NFL Daily, and it's time to predict and preview Thursday Night Football. I'm excited. This is a great TNF game. Mm-hmm. Dolphins and Bills, and you should check out myself. And Bill Barnwell of ESPN, one of the very best in the business. We're going to go live on YouTube about 15 minutes after the game. Once we get our notes in order and we'll do our TNF recap then. But let's talk about this game. Two teams that won in week one. Gives a little extra juice when it's two 1-0 teams. Mm -hmm. Uh, These two teams have obviously played a lot over the last couple of years because they also had a playoff game two years ago. And it, it sort of slipped my mind that the Bills have won four in a row. Uh, so Sean McDermott's kind of had Mike McDaniel's number, although most of them have been close. Uh, but last year in a big spot, uh, the Dolphins were, I think were three and zero, and the Bills went down to Miami and put a hurt on them. And then they won the division against them in week 18 in Buffalo. So right now the division goes through Buffalo. What, what did we take Colleen kind of, out of week one that we can push forward into this match. Okay. Well, both of these teams rallied from 14 point deficits in the first half to win their respective games. Um, Obviously for Buffalo, for both teams, it's a short week, but for Buffalo, it's a short week to prepare for a really fast team. I'm really excited to see Jordan Poyer in this game who spent seven seasons in Buffalo. Now he signed with Miami play against Josh Mm. Allen after going against him so many years in practice, they finally get to actually have a real game matchup against each other. Um, And Josh Allen coming off of that game where he had, it was a crazy game for him, four touchdowns. He was hurtling. He was running all over the place. They were worried about his left arm for a while, but as Steve Mariucci said last night, left arm, uh, left hand doesn't even matter. You don't even need it if you're throwing (laughs) with your right one. Um, But Josh Allen picked apart Miami secondary last year in both of those games. So I think that this is one that it's obviously going to be an awesome game. I loved watching Joe Brady run the ball in Buffalo. He just fed James Cook. It just opened things up. Um, And then defensively, the Bills, they're going to need Cam Lewis again to step up because Teron Johnson, they won't have him. They're nickel corner. He hurt his forearm against the Cardinals in that first drive. And Lewis was pretty effective stopping Mm. the pass and the run in his place. And he takes a lot of pride in his versatility that he plays at that position. Um, He can play corner safety, nickel corner, and he can just wear a lot of different hats in the secondary. They can rotate him around. So he's kind of their Swiss army knife, which they're lucky to have. Yeah. Teron Johnson was a guy. I remember the athletic uh, Joe, Joe Basaglia does a great job with him. He he had a list of like, who are the most indispensable players Mm -hmm. on their entire team? I think he had Teron Johnson number two. Yeah. So it's just because he's so good. And so that's something you worry about obviously going against the Dolphins who can, you know, put Tyreek or Jalen Waddle in the slot. I think the best defense maybe against the Dolphins is just being a loaded offense. It's what, you know, the reason I picked this Buffalo's team to win the Super Bowl was because of their offense. Now the matchup was right in week one, but they led the entire NFL by far in success rate. They went up and down the field on the Cardinals, despite falling uh, from behind. They went for fourth down 
a couple times in situations where Sean McDermott, I don't think would have in the past. It didn't work in the first half. It worked in the second half. So like, I love you. I love that Sean McDermott stay aggressive. This is an offensive team now. And I just love the cohesion in the running game. It looks so good. Like they know when to use Josh Allen as a runner in the red zone without majoring in that. But Ray Davis has some burst as a backup and James Cook looks awesome. And it looks like an offensive line Jordan that has been together now for a couple of years. They just gave Spencer Brown a, a new contract actually this week. And I love that running game going up against this Dolphins defense, who I thought also played well in week one. Yeah, because the Dolphins pressure is looks a little bit better so far early. Obviously, they got some guys back from from injuries last season. So you're going to if you're the Bills and Josh Allen, you are going to want, want to run the ball at this front. I think kind of ironically, um, they're going to what, what I would do if I were them would be to do similar to what the Cardinals initially tried to do against Josh Allen and the Bills, which is load up, run the ball and play keep away and try to keep the ball out of Tua Tagovailoa's hands, out of Tyreek Hill's hands, and specifically to protect your own defense, which is super vulnerable to Bills defenses in the middle of the field at inside linebacker. And at safety, where they've been having quite a few issues with coverage, um, the Cardinals were really effectively able to use misdirection um, to change the contact points against some of these linebackers and safeties. Taylor Rapp struggled in coverage. And you're also, again, like to, to y'all's point, you're, you're without Taron Johnson. And the Dolphins are the misdirection pre-snap motion <laughs> kings, right? 79% yep. of offensive plays in week one. They're also... Use, they're also running the ball, and, and a lot of Tua Tungavailoa's passing is coming out of pistol to keep the misdirection in the run game, 41.5% and 40% in shotgun. So they're really keeping everything open in front to try to get a lot of that pre-snap movement going. So again, to, to your point, Greg, if the Bills can run the ball effectively, you actually can keep the ball out of Tua Tungavailoa's hands and out of that offensive offensive hand, offense's hands where the Dolphins are kind of kings at attacking the parts of the field where the Bills are the most vulnerable right now. Right. Last week, uh, who is it? Terrell Bernard had a tough time against the the Cardinals and, and Dorian Williams, who's, who's stepping in for Matt Milano. He struggled. Uh, I like the aggro Tua. They, him and McDaniel kind of talked about this idea of skipping reads that in the past, like he had the like a high-low concept where the, the receiver's open underneath and that's actually his first read. But now he's kind of learned like, hey, that I seen what I see pre-snap and knowing it's Tyreek out there, like, let's just skip past that first read. Let's get super aggressive. And they protected pretty well. I, I want to take back what I said on the Sunday night recap after rewatching this game a little bit. I think the offensive line actually played well. They feel good right now that they have at least three quality players. They have the right tackle who they gave money to. Toronto Armstead's healthy right now. And they got center Aaron Brewer back who had a nice first game and they're going to be going up. Yeah. I think the offenses have the advantages on both sides of the ball. Uh, although little Von Miller pop week one, Von Miller was kind of back. Greg Rousseau. Greg really Rousseau, I think off. is making the yeah, leap, but yeah. Von, Von Miller had like five pressures. He didn't play the whole game. I think that's good. Maybe a little less is more for Von Miller. Uh, cause so he, and he sacked Kyler uh, Murray like three times three. and he had the force fumble. I, uh, I love this, uh, too. When I look at uh, the Bills secondary, the matchup of Tyreek Hill and Christian Benford, who's, who's kind of like a sneaky, like Pro Bowl, like potential candidate. I He had a really good week one. A lot of it was against Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, he shut them down. And then you mentioned finally the, the Dolphins defense. New coordinator, Anthony Weaver, didn't really blitz at all uh, in week one, which was interesting. And they got some good pressure. Jalen Phillips is back from this Achilles tear and had a really good week one Jalen Ramsey did not. And so that's just something to watch. Maybe it was, he wasn't practicing Coming for a while. Hamstring. Yeah. So maybe that was an issue. Calais Campbell, what an amazing signing everything he went through. That was terrible last week. Um, but kind of lost in that is like Calais Campbell was on the field and was one of the best players. Again, he's, he's ageless. He's just remarkable <laughs> as a, as a player, as a, a human. human. Oh my gosh. He's one of the best. And uh, like he was one of the reasons they, they won that game an early sack in that game. All right, let's pick it. Uh, we'll start with you, Jordan. I'm going to pick the Dolphins just because I, I do think that if you can stop the run against the Bills, a tall task, that's a big if, if you can stop the run against the Bills mm. and get the ball back into the Dolphins offenses hands. The Bills are so, so vulnerable in the parts of the field that Tua and that offense likes to attack and is very successful at. Oh my God, this is such a tough one to call, but I 
think just because of the dolphin speed on the short week and then all of the issues that Buffalo has on their defense, like there's just too many ways that Mike McDaniel can attack them. So it's, I'm going to go dolphin. Always tough for the road team on the Thursday night. Yeah. Uh, Second week, especially this is something where like whichever team can just rotate in players because like you're not really ready to play a full game and then you're really not ready to play another full game four days later. But I'm taking the bills. Only one of these teams has Josh Allen. That's my MVP pick. And I love I loved how he played in week one. He had one play where he held it too long and fumbled. Uh, But for the most part, actually, I thought he's making quicker decisions. I just think he gets these two quarterbacks are so much better than they were two years ago in terms of decision making. He's making quicker decisions, throwing the ball, too. So just I'm taking the team that has Josh Allen and that has won four straight in this matchup. Uh, This is a big one. I like it. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, That's it. We got uh, our preview show on Thursday dropping Steve Weish in the Chris Wesleyan podcast studio. And uh, of course, Patrick Claybon. So please uh, check out uh, the the week two preview show and cannot wait. We did some really excellent self work today, guys. You should be proud. <laughs> Multiple things came true. We are we are worthy of love. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Not and, like totally and leave different. him if he's bad to you. <laughs> don't even think twice. You don't need him anymore. Football's back. <laughs>